good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to be coming back to you and uh, very excited about the topic that we have for today and, and uh, for the guests that are joining us and to be presenting with the Learning Policy Institute. We really appreciate their partnership on that. Before I, uh, before I launch into that topic, I just have a few uh, items that I want to go over with you. Um, just to provide an overview of our restart and recovery supports, we've been putting things out at a very rapid pace uh, and just wanted to make sure that everyone on the call is aware of all of those uh, resources. Uh, in the past two months that you've been engaged in rapid critical decision making to ensure health and safety of your students, teachers, staff, and navigating challenges around devices and connectivity and offering continuous learning guidance to school. Um, and many, over this past weekend, we were so excited to be a part of the celebration uh, for Graduate Together uh, and uh, being able to offer that opportunity where uh, state chiefs could give um, a, a graduation uh, note to the, their graduates in their states. But we're also focused on the hard work that needs to be done, which is guidance around both summer and fall. We recently uh, shared guidance on virtual summer school, as well as guidance on building, cleaning, safety, and monitoring, which I, I need to give a nod to our friends at LPI, uh, who just released, I think today, um, a new resource that uh, I think Linda will share a little more about, but we use that to help inform the uh, work that we were doing. Uh, we also released the Restart and Recovery Framework, which outlined the phases of work. I, I will just say the reason we chose to do this is we felt like there were so many moving parts that we needed to make sure that it coalesced around a, a clear vision for all the things that we were hearing from both state chiefs and from uh, SEA leaders about what must be addressed uh, as we think about both going back to school and what um, some of the new things that we're, that we're facing and, and how we can think about the supports and needed things for students. Um, so far, our work uh, has included an emphasis on physical safety, mental health, uh, academic success for all students, but mostly our most vulnerable student populations. And we'll focus on this work in four broad categories. Uh, the continuity of learning, the conditions for learning, which includes a focus on SEL, mental health, and physical health and well-being, leadership and planning, and policy and funding. And so today I know that, uh, that Linda is going to talk about a number of things uh, about the science of learning, but really honing in on some of these things about the conditions for learning that make it so important. Um, we, we still, we do have a very clear focus on equity um, as well. And I just feel like we need to take a pause at a moment to say this, that, that our focus on our vulnerable populations, including our students living in poverty and our students of color, students of disabilities, homeless youth and our English language learners um, have been affected in tremendous ways uh, through this crisis, along with all students, but those students in particular um, face some really significant challenges. So we have a long history of being a convener and a connector in the education community to give states the best possible support. And today's webinar is an opportunity to do just that by elevating expert thinking uh, for partners and state leaders in the education community and on improving conditions for learning to support the whole child. Um, I probably don't need to introduce her. Her name I kind of stands by itself, but let me do the introductions uh, for Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond is the president and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute, the Charles E. Oh, I don't know that I've ever said this one. Dukeman, Linda, you'll have to correct me. Professor of Education Emeritus at Stanford University, where she founded the Stanford Center for Opportunity Policy and Education and served as the faculty sponsor for the Stanford Teacher Education Program, which she helped to redesign. She also serves as the president of the California State Board of Education, and she's going to share insights from research on the science of learning and development for supporting the whole child and reflections on the action state can take to support the whole child and restart recovery. Uh, and I consider, I consider Linda a friend as well. So Linda, I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Um, and it's great to be partnering with CCSSO. I really appreciate the leadership that the organization has shown in this 
difficult time, we're all looking to one another. I serve as president of the State Board of Education in California, and uh, we're all, you know, very much in the learning mode about how to manage this crisis and also how to bring the whole child back to school, as I as I put it here. Um, so I'm going to share a few ideas um, about this rooted in the science of learning and development. Um, I have a blog coming out in Forbes today. It's probably posted now that summarizes a lot of these ideas if you're interested in seeing more about it. And I'll ask whoever's controlling the cursor to take us to the next slide. So all around the world, you know, schools are reopening. Uh, one of the documents that Carissa mentioned is one that we put out, I think uh, it went out last Friday on international guidelines for restarting schools. You can see Denmark on the left with lots of physical distancing and Taiwan on the right with uh, less physical distance, but dividers and masks on the students and the teacher. And you can see that people are taking different approaches to this question of safely reopening schools in different contexts. Next slide. Uh, and, you know, what we know from the science of learning and development uh, should guide uh, the way in which we approach this task of uh, restart and recovery. Um, the brain and development, first of all, are malleable. That's really good news. That is to say throughout our entire lives, our brains continue to uh, grow and, you know, wire and uh, change in response to the environment around us. Next bullet. So relationships become hugely important. One of the things we've learned from neuroscience is that just the ways in which relationships uh, create the hormonal and brain architecture development uh, by whether they bring sort of the kind of oxytocin uh, that comes from warm relationships, hugging, affirmation, uh, interaction, and the neuron connections that go along with that, or whether they bring a lot of cortisol, which is the response to stress, adrenaline, uh, that actually um, wires things in unpredictable and more challenging ways, uh, makes a big difference for healthy development and learning. The next bullet. Children, of course, actively construct their knowledge uh, based on their experiences and context. And as we all know as educators, the nature of those experiences and those contexts is very, very critical. Um, when children feel uh, that they can connect things that they know to the things that they're learning, they're more effective learners. When they are in a safe uh, and welcoming environment, they're able to learn more effectively. Uh, when the context provides rich opportunities for exploration and inquiry, they learn more effectively. Next bullet. And uh, of course, learning is social, emotional, and academic, and that is all intertwined together. Uh, we can't disassemble it. Um, we have had sometimes uh, a feeling when there's been pressure on schools to produce higher and higher test scores, that there wasn't time for social and emotional learning, but it turns out that when we give kids both social and emotional skills for managing their feelings, for focusing their attention, for being resilient, for dealing with conflict uh, productively, for um, confronting and, and problem solving around obstacles, they actually do much better academically. And there are strong improvements in academics when we take the time to both support social and emotional development and give students their own tools to manage their own social and emotional learning. Next slide. Adversity also affects learning, and Carissa reminded us this morning that there are some of our students who are experiencing uh, much more adversity uh, than others, and almost everyone is experiencing some. Uh, the good news is that it can be mitigated by secure long-term relationships. The word long-term is important there because our schools are often constructed for a, a series of short-term relationships. Um, it can be mitigated by supportive 
contexts that provide a sense of belonging and psychological as well as physical safety, um, experiences that foster self-efficacy and purpose when kids feel like they can do things, when they're enabled to be successful and confident, uh, it actually gives them a, a sort of locus of control that allows them to m more effectively manage the challenges in their lives. And then, as I mentioned, social and emotional supports and skills. Next slide. So reopening school is an opportunity also to not only recover, but to reinvent practice. And I think many of us are seeing it in that way. And if we uh, look at science-informed principles of practice, which we've outlined um, in some documents that, that you can get from the Learning Policy Institute, one of them called Educating the Whole Child, um, there are four major areas of work in the school um, that can dramatically support children's learning and development. One is, of course, um, creating a positive school climate in which attachment and relationships and safety and belonging are prioritized. Uh, a second is social and emotional development, everything from self-regulation and interpersonal skills to uh, perseverance and resilience that come from a growth mindset. A third is productive instructional strategies, and now uh, more than ever those need to deal with uh, metacognition and learning to learn, uh, since kids are, you know, doing more of their learning themselves, managing their own learning, as well as um, learning from others. And then systems of support that wrap around the child uh, in an integrated system. Next slide. So in our um, whole child policy table in which we work with CCSSO and other state-facing organizations, uh, we think about the policy work here as focusing on setting a whole child vision that permeates uh, all of the things we do and making that explicit, um, sometimes with uh, the way in which standards and guidelines are set, sometimes the way in which grants and uh, funds are allocated. Uh, transforming learning settings so that they build on these principles, uh, supporting the right kind of instruction. Uh, building adult capacity becomes, of course, a huge part of the policy agenda. Uh, people can't do what they don't know how to do. And then, of course, organizing and leveraging resources. Uh, and I'm going to speak to those in one minute. Turn to the next slide. So I'm going to... Um, take a minute to talk about a top 10 list uh, for preparing for restart and recovery, and I would argue also reinvention. If we reopen schools uh, in the ways that uh, they uh, have existed with substantial inequality uh, across them and built into some of the ways in which many schools function uh, with uh, approaches that are not supportive of the way in which people actually learn, uh, we will have missed an opportunity. Um, I'm very um, passionate about the moment for closing the digital divide. I know you're all working on that and seeing it. It was raised into relief, of course, by the distance learning needs that have emerged from closing schools. Um, it actually turns out that you know, the amount of money that it would cost to close the digital divide relative to the amount we spend generally um, is, uh, and most states are probably within 15 or 20 percent of, of having closed that divide. We've, in California, probably had about one in five kids without connectivity and devices at home. We've more than uh, closed that divide by more than half, but we have uh, hard work to do to get to the other end of that. But it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Today, in this moment, uh, we not only need to close that divide uh, for the moment, but we're going to go in and out of distance learning as COVID, you know, rolls along. Many of our uh, districts are in places where other events will close schools, whether those are floods or hurricanes or fires, um, so being able to go in and out. But it's also a survival mechanism. Not only does it determine who can easily do their homework, and access, you know, tools on the internet, but it also determines which families can get telehealth, which families can apply for jobs, get benefits, 
um, manage their lives in ways that are safe and productive. So it's a moment where in every state, I think we have to prioritize our ability to close the digital divide. It's also an important way to keep those social and emotional connections going uh, between teachers and other school staff and students uh, when they can see one another, uh, when they can um, you know, have the uh, personal touch, if you will, without touching uh, that um, you know, the, the video as well as audio capability provides. So I think it's you know, got to be a top priority for us. Um, in, in our state, out of the you know, um, $1.3 billion that will come from the CARES Act, it'll probably cost a couple hundred million to close the digital divide. Um, it's, you know, a, a high priority because on it that we can build so many other things that are helpful for taking care of the whole child. Um, the second thing, of course, is to continue to strengthen distance learning, but also to begin to think about blended learning. Um, we will have distance learning not only for um, the, you know, moments when schools cannot be safely opened or when they have to close and then reopen again. We'll also have the situation where um, when kids have been exposed or staff have been exposed to someone um, who is infected with COVID, they'll need to be quarantined, they'll need to be uh, home for periods of time. So teachers are learning a lot about how to engage in productive distance learning. Um, and, you know, in many cases making enormous strides in a new pedagogy that I'm seeing examples of um, working well in some cases, it's obviously quite uneven, um, and we've got, you know, uh, folks, you know, who are brand new to any kind of technology, as well as folks who are at the cutting edge of being able to use, you know, Zoom uh, breakout rooms and have the paraprofessional aid working with the students with learning differences in a special Zoom room while others are working on other things and then bringing people back together and uh, using chats and a variety of other tools in productive ways. But we've got to keep at it uh, and continue to strengthen educators' capacities to use those pedagogies well. And then I think we'll see when people come back into the classroom uh, that technology can be used in more productive ways if we also begin to think productively about blended learning models. And I know many of you are deep into this, and I think that that is, on the other end of this, a part of what we ought to aspire to do is to use technologies in ways that are productive for kids. What we know from research is that uh, when uh, students get the right mix of teachers and peers and technology used for inquiry and the development of products and uh, ways of demonstrating their knowledge. It can be a, a big net plus in their achievement. Uh, we've also seen that simply kids, sitting kids in front of computers for electronic workbooks actually does not, uh, in any of the big studies, uh, produce gains in achievement. So using technology in the right ways uh, and figuring out how to blend it with uh, in school and out of school is going to be important. We may have situations where kids are in school on certain days and home on other days and where they're using technology as the bridge between those two places. I think it's also important right now to begin uh, to think about how to emphasize authentic learning and assessment. Um, many of the uh, teachers having the most success right now are those who are working with children around how to uh, use this moment to learn things that uh, are relevant to the experience they're having, to build on what they learned earlier in the year, uh, write you know, that book club essay about books that you read earlier, uh, engage in a debate about a social issue or uh, some other issue that you're looking at, learn science um, through experimentation in the home, as well as you know, ways to um, demonstrate what you can learn from inquiry online. Um, kids need to know that learning matters, that it counts, that it's connected to what they care about, um, and assessment right now is beginning to follow suit to a greater and greater degree, and I think that's positive and something to be built on as we go back to school. Um, many, many states 
Minnesota being one that has statewide um, guidance for social and emotional learning, uh, are doing really productive work. Washoe County in Nevada has a social emotional learning program that's a daily program. There are many um, folks who are figuring out how to blend that in. Of course, we want that to continue as well uh, once we get, quote, back to school. Coming back to school is going to be very um, challenging. And it's important that we do that in ways that build on, uh, build strong relationships. Some experts are actually suggesting that students go back to the teachers to the extent that it's plausible, who they had last year, who already know them, know how they learn, understand who they are, know their family, and can figure out what they need, what they've learned, what their situation is, and build on it to get them back uh, into the groove in a very productive way, potentially passing them on to the next grade level teacher uh, after the first quarter or even continuing in a looping relationship. Schools that have longer term relationships with kids do typically get better uh, achievement outcomes because of the depth of knowledge that they have. Secondary schools um, that don't yet have advisory systems or mentoring systems of some sort uh, will need to create those if kids are gonna have an anchor and an adult who will know them well and help them negotiate uh, both the shoals of uh, re-engaging academics uh, and the needs that they may have for services beyond the, uh, the academic. So schools uh, across the country have worked on redesign. Uh, many have uh, developed these stronger, longer-term relationships than the ones that we inherited from the factory model school. This is a time to really strengthen that. Chiefs for Change recently put out a very interesting back to school document, uh, which has a variety of ideas for how to redesign schools around relationships that could sustain uh, educators and kids together in this time. And I think this is a great time to think about it. Uh, next slide. Our images of what that may look like could be a blend of you know, kids working together, uh, using technologies both on their own at home uh, and in school and uh, engaging in really experiential work as well, which is gonna be very important, planting that garden, um, engaging in, you know, water and sand play, engaging in the arts. So finding that, that blend of really um, experiential opportunities um, supported by technology will be, will be key. Next slide. The last points I will make is simply that as we prepare for, for restart recovery and reinvention, you know, closing the gap, as Carissa said, is so important. And uh, these are times where uh, as we use CARES Act money, HEROES Act is coming down the pike, um, hopefully um, bigger and, and better than the last Recovery Act. Um, these are uses of funding that can be thought about um, and are important. Uh, we're seeing how community schools uh, that have uh, integrated health, mental health, uh, expanded learning time, social services for kids are really able to meet kids' needs at this time. And there is funding in the CARES Act um, and in the um, HEROES Act for that kind of investment to enable schools to wrap around more efficiently and effectively so that families are not trying to deal with fragmented bureaucracies to get what they need and kids uh, are really uh, the focus of the attention around how to integrate all of the supports that they need. New York and um, Maryland are two states that have direct support to community schools um, that in high poverty communities enables them to coordinate those services for kids. And we've heard many stories there and in California and other states that have local uh, engagement around community schools about how uh, much better positioned they have been to meet students' needs during this time. Uh, obviously, expanded learning time is on everyone's mind. Starting in the summer uh, and going beyond, this may be the time to um, move beyond the agrarian calendar um, many um, uh, districts and um, a number of countries, you know, 
spread school out over the, the whole school year with smaller breaks in between, which lead to less learning loss. Um, uh, Florida got terrific results when they added uh, an hour of reading for every kid in about 300 schools that were low performing. Uh, they saw tremendous gains by expanding learning time during the school year in a very purposeful way. Um, there are lots of ways to do this. It is a time to really think uh, productively about where and how to ensure that kids have the time to catch up in a way that doesn't uh, identify a bunch of them as behind or below, but picks them up from where they are with good, thoughtful diagnostic assessments and moves them forward on a continuous learning uh, trajectory uh, without stigmatizing them, uh, but by uh, accelerating progress um, around formative assessments that can really support that growth process. It's also potentially a time to leverage more equitable funding um, in the way that you decide to give out the money from CARES and the HEROES Act uh, to meet the needs of the kids who are most vulnerable. But also, interestingly, it was when California got to the very nadir of its funding under the last recession, when we cut per pupil expenditures by about $2,000 per pupil, that a brand new funding scheme was brought in, a new funding formula, very progressive with weighted, uh, with weighted student formula for poverty English learners, foster care children, homeless children. Uh, everybody got more money as new money came into the system, but it was distributed more equi equitably with more flexibility, uh, fewer categorical programs, and uh, the end result has really begun to uh, reduce the achievement gap by taking advantage of that moment when you could have a different conversation about school finance. Uh, the last point I'll make, because uh, it is what reduces the gap when we, uh, at the very beginning, is how important it will be to sustain our early childhood education programs, uh, which are many of them going belly up. They're very slim margins in early childhood. You know how low the wages are, uh, the tensions between, you know, investment in reimbursement rates and, um, and affordability for parents. Uh, but if we... Um, want to continue to build early learning, as so many of you are already doing in, you know, states uh, ranging from West Virginia to Washington to New Jersey to Oklahoma and so on, we're going to have to take some special effort right now to be sure that those programs um, are sustained and can be reactivated um, when we get um, to recovery and reinvention. And I'll stop there so that we can have a conversation. Thanks, Linda. Um, I think we're gonna. Um, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna have Paulo uh, do his presentation, and then we'll do questions uh, all throughout that. If you have time to stick with us, that sounds great. Okay, perfect. Uh, so it's it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Superintendent uh, Paulo De Maria, who is the Superintendent of Public Instruction for the Ohio Department of Education. Paulo is known as a passionate leader, a tireless work, worker, a respectful listener, and an energetic advocate. I, I can definitely double down on that, an energetic advocate for Ohio's 1.7 million student, students. Um, and he has been called on uh, with all these daily during his tenure as Ohio superintendent uh, to deal with the COVID uh, crisis. So, Paulo, you're going to share with us the state perspective of how you in Ohio are working on, on full child matters um, and uh, some of the things that Linda probably discussed here, and then we'll coalesce around uh, some Q&A. Paulo. Thanks, Carissa. I appreciate it. And thanks, Linda. I really appreciated your comments as well. It's great to be with you all. If uh, this was an in-person meeting, I would likely give an OH shout out that would be responded by all the Ohioans in the room saying I-O, but that really doesn't work in a virtual setting. So I'll just have to pretend. Um, anyway, um, what I'm going to do is just sort of provide a little bit of a, a, a discussion about the architecture and the approach in Ohio around meeting the needs of the whole child. And so I'm going to start a little bit by talking about the importance of having a shared vision. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about leadership. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about structural components that embrace this notion of meeting the needs of the whole child. 
mention a little bit about standards, uh, which to me signifies common language and common understanding, and then some programmatic elements. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, how it all plays in the, in the context of COVID, both in terms of the school building closures that we recently um, uh, endured here in the state and, and the upcoming reopening. So let's go back and begin with a vision. When I first became super, superintendent four years ago, we were very much at the outset of submitting our um, Every Student Succeeds Act plan. And in the process of developing that plan, it became clear to me that uh, we actually had to do something more than just comply with the federal guidance and the questions that the feds ask in their very sort of sometimes sterile way. Um, and, and we had to really reconceive of what is Ohio's strategic direction for education. And, and we developed our strategic plan called Each Child, Our Future. And if you were to go to the website right now and look up that strategic plan and see the infographic that accompanies it, you will see right at the center is the whole child. And so as we had our town hall meetings, as we had our work groups engaged with all the associations and practitioners represented, as we brought in experts and so forth and so on, it became really clear to us that we had to address the needs of the whole child. And in fact, we had to talk about learning domains that went beyond simply the academic and extended into uh, social emotional learning and leadership reasoning skills. Uh, because if we actually wanted to fulfill our goal, which was to create students who were ready to succeed in a post-secondary setting, we had to get at all those components. And the, the beauty of the strategic plan is that as more and more people uh, not only participated in its development, but read it and embraced it, it that notion of the, of the needs of the whole child uh, became prevalent throughout a lot of the work that was being done. And, and I still am surprised every time I, I go to a conference or something and somebody uses, somebody from Ohio at district level, you know, uses the strategic plan as a basis for their discussion or uses um, uh, references to the strategic plan and some of the ideas in it as they make their presentation. Because that tells me that, that it, you know, it has begun to take root in, in a broader way than simply at the SEA level. The second thing I wanted to talk about is really the notion of leadership. You can have a great vision, but if you really aren't aren't leading against that vision, then it's likely not to take hold. And I think what we found is, and 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 I especially want to pay compliments to Governor Mike DeWine, our current governor. He he came uh, to the governorship about a year, a little more than a year and almost a half ago, um, with just a very very strong commitment to not only children and their needs in general, but also to this idea of meeting the needs of the whole child. Um, and again, not to, you know, not to really comment on prior governors, because I think they, too, had that sense. But it really became much more pronounced um, with Governor DeWine, because he had an established record both in the U.S. Senate and as the state's attorney general, and even prior to that as the state's lieutenant governor, um, about caring and understanding the real challenges that students face, um, you know, from a, from, a, from a daily living kind of perspective. Um, uh, and so... Um, what happened when the strategic plan was finalized is it resulted, I'm now transitioning to this idea of the structural components at the, at the state education agency. We use that as an opportunity to reconfigure ourselves. So a lot of programs that previously had sort of been in silos got brought together. Um, we asked people to have those uncomfortable conversations that sometimes need to take place to see how do we better integrate. And so we actually established an office of integrated student supports um, in, in one of the centers of our agency that brought together all the different things that we had been doing up until that time and really saw a blossoming uh, and a deepening of the understanding of how can we organize ourselves to meet the needs of the whole child and what can we do to support that work as it happens in, um, in schools and districts. Um, the other thing is we established a whole child advisory group uh, that again, built off some initial work where we tried to identify all the different things that were happening that spoke to meeting the needs of the whole child. That was meant to be a short-term project, but it ultimately became a long-term advisory group because we saw that that work had to continue and had to be something that was um, on an ongoing basis, constantly thinking about how do we do that better? How do we evaluate the success and the progress that we're making? How do we identify bumps in the road and, and get past those? And how do we leverage all the great partnerships that are instrumental in getting that done? Um, the, the other structural element I would suggest uh, took place in Ohio was deepening our connections with other state agencies that also had as part of their mission addressing the needs of children. Um, one of those was the Department of Medicaid. Uh, one of those was the Department of Mental Health. One of those was the Department of Health. 
Um, and, and the other was the Department of Job and Family Services, which houses a lot of our uh, child care programming, as well as social services supports um, and um, uh, child protective services and those uh, sorts of activities. And, and we really uh, deliberately strengthened those collaborations as we continue to move forward, because one of the instrumental principles in our strategic plan is partnerships. And, and essentially saying that, you know, raising and educating Ohio's children is everybody's business. And so no, we are going to leave no stone unturned to identify those partners and to leverage what they can bring to the table um, in the interest of meeting the needs of the whole child. And so um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the programmatic elements that derive from those partnerships, but I wanted to spend a, just a moment to reflect on standards. Because the other thing we have found to be very powerful is having some common language around some of this work to ensure that people can talk to each other intelligently and understand what it is that we're trying to achieve. So one of those pieces was uh, the adoption of a set of social emotional learning standards, um, which again, once we finalized that work, I was, I was in a meeting with some directors of county mental health boards, and, and they actually were the ones that expressed to me how, how much it had been a, a kind of a breath of fresh air or allowed to them, almost gave them permission to have some of the conversations that maybe they had wanted to have, but felt as if they weren't you know, necessarily empowered or that they might be out of their element if they had those. Um, we also have a set of school climate guidelines that were actually developed a long time ago in response to uh, some anti-bullying legislation, uh, but that also form the basis for additional activity that we're doing um, and a lot of work in the um, positive behavior interventions and supports space um, that, that, that actually speaks significantly to the notion of school climate. We've also done a good bit of work in trauma-informed practices because we see that those kinds of specific uh, attention and understanding about uh, trauma among students and adverse childhood experiences is really tremendously important in, again, meeting the needs of the whole child and helping students uh, become of a, of a disposition to engage in the learning process. So then programmatically, um, uh, you know, all these things began to take shape in the last budget. And it's, and it's in some ways a little bit of a sad story because now that the economy uh, is struggling, um, uh, you know, some of these programs are being threatened. But, but I think the momentum that we've built and the interest in the, in the, in the concepts is actually uh, will speak positively to, to them being sustained, even if all the resources aren't necessarily there. Um, but it started with uh, the governor making a huge investment over the two years of the Ohio Biennial budget over in excess of $650 million in what was called the Student Wellness and Success Fund. These were dollars that were distributed to all, um, all districts um, that were targeted towards a broad range of purposes, um, but those purposes were uh, con constrained around uh, meeting the needs of the whole child. And so they, they not only required a, a separate sort of planning uh, exercise, um, even though that list was fairly broad that focused on those purposes, but it also required that a district have a partnership with one of a number of um, entities, including local health care providers, local mental health providers, um, and other, you know, sort of similar entities that would be in the local community. And again, you know, we felt like both that that was um, important in infusing additional resources but also making people take deliberate action by having to develop this plan and strengthening the partnerships um, that were emerging as part of that process. The other thing that accompanied those wellness and success funds was an investment in prevention education that was put into the budget of the Department of Mental Health in the state. And those monies were distributed to the county mental health boards to create and provide uh, services and supports to district, districts in terms of prevention education. And those were supplemented with a little bit of uh, professional development money around prevention that was in our budget that we flowed through our regional education service centers uh, in the state. Many of you uh, in other states have regional entities. They're called educational service centers uh, here in Ohio. So, so again, with a thrust towards uh, you know, uh, issues like suicide prevention, drug prevention, um, those kinds of things, uh, and, and very much in a way that that um, provoked sort of integrative approaches between those resources and the student wellness and success funds. We were also the beneficiaries of a federal school climate transformation grant that helped expand and extend our work in, um, uh, in supporting the implementation of PBIS activity across the state. Um, and then we also um, started, and this was even prior to the completion of the strategic plan, a um, school health uh, network. 
Um, and, and the idea there was we were seeing increasingly across the state these very beautiful um, health, uh, health provider education partnerships emerging. And we wanted to elevate the best examples of that work and then replicate and, and foster even more uh, of that activity throughout uh, the district, uh, the state. So we started uh, this network to serve and we came up with a toolkit. We had all kinds of uh, convenings. Um, we brokered conversations between all our major children's hospitals as well as other uh, uh, healthcare intermediaries and looked for ways to expand. And one of the reasons we did that because of our deep partnership with the Department of Medicaid, you know, we found that increasingly, um, you know, Medicaid dollars, if people understood who Medicaid ed eligible children were and what their health care needs were, you could find ways to access that pool of resources in the interest of helping meet the health care needs of students in schools. And in fact, one of the great things we just recently completed was a set of what we called um, student health profiles um, that leveraged a matching of um, Department of Education data with Department of Medicaid data. Uh, to paint a picture of the Medicaid eligible students in each school district and some of the, you know, diagnoses that they had, what percentage of your of your students in that category, um, you know, have been diagnosed with uh, diabetes or asthma, uh, those kinds of things that again allow for a richer understanding by districts uh, and and a, and a guide to the planful partnerships with healthcare providers in their community. Um, the other thing that we've done is similarly promoting partnerships as part of our. Um, uh, school healthcare network activity um, in the mental health arena, because we were seeing many behavioral health providers for forming partnerships with schools and they're too leveraging Medicaid dollars in the interest of providing um, high quality uh, behavioral health supports um, for students in, in those districts. So, so, you know, so you have this, um, this uh, um, you know, all this different activity cascading from this kind of grand vision down to these very specific uh, programming elements and, and leveraging the common language so that, you know, we now have a lot of activity, a lot of conversations, a lot of uh, initiatives going uh, around, you know, uh, involving at the district level where these things are very prominent and very, um, uh, very prevalent. So, you know, the, the, once the uh, pandemic hits, again, we uh, kick into gear. Our, you know, our main job ended up being, you know, answering the thousands of questions that came our way about, um, you know, both the technical, like, you know, how do I take attendance and, you know, what, is, what are the implications for funding and those kinds of things to more of the, you know, child facing kinds of activities. So we developed one of our information documents and all these are listed on our coronavirus uh, webpage on, on our, our agency website um, was, uh, you know, we had a document called how to support your child's health and well-being during the ordered school building closure. Uh, and it was focused on giving uh, you know, schools guidelines about the kinds of things they can do. Um, we also found through our interactions with the Department of Job and Family Services that they were seeing a decrease in the number of referrals uh, for child protective services. And so we developed guidance to help inform teachers, you know, under the idea of you're, you're a mandatory reporter, but you're not an, interacting with children very much anymore, but you may still be having interactions by telephone or, or uh, you know, on, on video or in other ways, you know, what are those kinds of things you should be looking for? Or as, or as food distribution sites were distributing food to children, what other things could they be on the lookout um, to help address any abuse or neglect uh, that, might be, uh, that might be evident? Um, so, so again, it was a, a collaborative effort between uh, the state agency, other uh, sister agencies, the school districts, and in the interest of, um, of, of, of accepting the challenge of the unique circumstances created by the pandemic and acting against those. Now we have pretty much pivoted towards our reset and restart uh, activity. And there too, we understand that, you know, we are going to have to be addressing lots of different um, uh, whole child needs. Um, on the, uh, and, and I think the most challenging will likely speak to uh, a variety of different anxieties and traumas, both by virtue of the fact that students, you know, have been home, they've heard about, you know, uh, you know coronavirus, um, you know, and they're also, you know, how children are, they, they serve as sort of amplifiers of what the adults around them are feeling. So, so even as we're developing some of our health guidelines, or, you know, are students going to have to wear masks or no masks? Are students going to have to, you know, come every day or not come every day? Are students going to be safe on the buses or not on the buses? 
you know, we know that there's going to be different opinions, different perspectives, different levels of fear, different levels of comfort. Um, and how do we equip both ourselves at the SEA and our districts and, and all the staff members that are going to be working with students to approach these issues in a way that doesn't necessarily raise anxiety, but it, but more tries to find ways to comfort students. And, you know, and, and, and even asking ourselves questions about, you know, social distancing, like, you know, you know, when is it when is it okay for a teacher to hug a child? Right in, in these conditions and, you know, because those are legitimate questions that we that we can't avoid and that resonate both with teachers and with students and with families, all the while knowing that it increases, you know, increases the risks. And so, you know, we're partnering, you know, in some ways as much with our Department of Mental Health as with our Department of Health as we're designing um, some of the guidelines um, and, and also planning on supplementing our, you know, sort of health related. Uh, precautions and protocols uh, with mental health related resources um, and, and and resources that also continue to emphasize partnerships. We we not only want districts working with their local health departments to to understand you know health protocols, but we want them also working with local health providers in continuing partnership there, as well as with their uh, mental health providers and mental health county mental health boards, um, so that we continue to to um, excel and, and amplify those strong local partnerships. So with that, I'll stop and I'm happy to uh, join in the, the, the Q&A. Thank you, thank you, Paulo. Um, I think you answered one of the questions about the different kinds of uh, um, partnerships, uh, variety, a variety of ways in public health officials, uh, in your last comment, um, you, you all do have a really great partnerships around that. I'm going to scroll back to a question that, I, Linda, I believe this question is for you. Um, it was, are there uh, other after school and summer learning opportunities included in the expansion of learning time? There are plenty of evidence that quality programs and partnerships with other community resources are even better at reducing the achievement gap and then just expanding uh, versus just expanding the school day or year. Um, yes. Uh, the short answer is yes, there are lots of ways to use additional after school um, resources, including community partners to expand learning time. I think there, there's evidence that high quality strategies implemented in a variety of ways can you know, be effective. So, uh, and I do think that this is a time when there's gonna be both a need and an opportunity for schools to partner with community-based organizations in a lot of ways, including the fact that, you know, uh, in order to achieve um, social distancing, if that's the strategy for reopening schools, uh, there may be fewer kids in a classroom at a given moment in time and various kinds of rotating schedules and community-based partners uh, may be part of the uh, regular school day for supports and enrichment and um, care for students um, when they cannot be in the classroom. So uh, we're gonna need to be creative uh, about how to use those strategies in a variety of ways. I would also note that there's a lot of terrific material on the Wallace Foundation website about the effectiveness of different strategies for expanding learning time. Uh, and there's a terrific book by Jeannie Oakes on that topic that I re recommend to anyone who is trying to think about this. Thanks, Linda. I'll actually ask both of you to address this. I want to ask us what, what role higher ed can play, if any, in safe reopening of, of schools. And I assume we mean K-12 schools, um, because they have their own set of uh, um, issues in opening back up themselves. And, and California uh, has made some of those decisions, so. Right, so this is Paulo again, I used to work for the higher ed system, so they do have their own challenges. Um, I recently uh, had the opportunity to speak to the leadership staff at the uh, um, OSU College of Education. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think they continue to be interested in being productive and strong partners, especially with Columbus Public Schools, but more broadly with the, with the State Department. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and, and teacher preparation is going to be even more important than ever. There, there have been lots of concerns about, you know, what will what will um, the pandemic mean to our teacher supply chains uh, and those kinds of things, and how do we uh, make sure we're being attentive? And a lot of professional development that'll have to take place. And, and, and also, uh, I think Linda made this point: a lot of exploration and innovative approaches. And I think that's another area where uh, higher education can play a role. 
Yeah, and I also think that just back to your point, Paolo, about um, student teachers and, you know, the production of teachers, um, this is an opportunity where we're going to need a lot of adults in schools to both manage the necessary absences of folks who may either uh, display symptoms or have been exposed and need to, you know, isolate both adults um, as well as kids and the fact that we may need more um, classrooms in order to accommodate physical distancing. So I would encourage higher education to think about how to um, uh, engage uh, student teachers in as much clinical experience <laughs> as possible. You know, I've long advocated for all student teachers to get a full year of, at least a full year of practicum work in the classroom, uh, if not more. Um, this is an opportunity for, you know, really using, um, you know, the partnership of higher education and teachers in training and leaders in training to extend the capacity of the workforce. Yeah, um, it, there's an interesting question about uh, high school students. We, we do spend a lot of time talking about younger students. There's been a lot of plans talking about having younger students come back in. Um, if distance learning needs to continue, keeping high schoolers. Uh, this particular question is about how plans to renew and reopen are being geared specifically to the unique needs of high school students. Um, and are the students themselves advising on those plans? So I'll open that up for either of you. Uh, Paul, do you want to start on that one? Uh, sure, sure. Again, you know, in Ohio, we're, you know, we have 600 plus school districts. So invariably, I hear stories that are, you know, amazing examples of exactly that. So I know uh, that there in Ohio, there are a number of places where uh, they are engaging with high school students uh, as they think through their um, uh, their reopening plans. We've done a little bit of that also at the SEA level. Um, and, and I was just on a Zoom call with some of our uh, uh, students brought together by our, uh, the Ohio Association of Student Leaders. And, um, you know, again, I'm always impressed when I talk to students because they have deep insights into not only the experience that they've had during the school closure, but their, their conceptualization of, you know, how we can improve the high school experience. We also have a little effort underway right now that started prior to all this about, re, you know, um, redesigning high school and what that looks like. And I think that that's gotten a lot of my staff uh, thinking about and, and and we're trying to disseminate some of this information um, about, you know, how could the high school experience look differently and still be a lot a very robust, very um, meaningful uh, experience uh, for students that, you know, that goes beyond what sort of the traditional approach uh, produces. I think that um, just to echo some of that and add on, um, this is a great opportunity both for high school students to be part of the redesign effort, but also for um, educators to be very explicit about the fact that we should be gearing the curriculum to support students learning to manage their own learning, to learn about their cognitive strategies, to figure out how to plan and execute on you know, projects and, and activities. They're going to be probably in and out of school, uh, as you noted. They may be on rotating schedules or, you know, on distance learning some days and in the classroom and others. And we should be really getting past transmission teaching to, um, you know, teaching that's very focused on enabling them to learn to manage uh, as much of their uh, own uh, activity, reflecting on their work, self and peer assessment, you know, demonstrating their learning in a variety of ways and potentially contributing to the learning of younger children, um, helping with the expanded learning time, uh, tutoring and mentoring, you know, younger students, um, you know, being part of that um, effort to create these uh, opportunities for both personalized support and uh, focused, um, you know, tutoring and mentoring. So it's an opportunity for us to allow kids to grow up and engage in very um, exciting and experiential ways if we use it properly. Yeah, I think yeah, I think I, you're going to see shifts to more project-based learning, more student-directed learning, uh, students having a voice in both the, uh, the the subject areas that they explore and the modalities that are used to explore those. But and I think it's going to be very exciting. We have uh, we have a 
ton of questions we're not going to get to because we're almost at time, but I'm going to close this out with one and give you guys just a couple minutes to respond to it, which I think is a good capstone. Um, and then uh, we're going to have uh, some resources put up that CCSO has created as well as LPI um, for, uh, and we'll continue this conversation. But the question balancing the oncoming wave of social and emotional needs with reopening as well as uh, the academic the academic loss and academic um, catching up. Um, can you guys can both of you talk about how you're thinking about that? I'm uh, sure I'll start uh, again. You know, one of the things that we've seen happen within the last couple of years um, is um, greater attentiveness uh, to some of those issues, even before the pandemic. So I love visiting schools. It's one of my most favorite things, which is why I'm suffering at this time because I can't do it very uh, at all. Um, but you know, more we saw more, um, you know, a focus on mindfulness in classrooms, um, a focus on um, you know, sort of calming spaces when when a student and 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 it's wonderful for me to see students who who have a greater awareness of their own um, responses, their own emotional state. And know where, you know, maybe they're reaching a certain breaking point and they know to ask their teacher, you know, I need to go to the to the counselor or to the calming room for a few minutes to to, you know, um, sort through my feelings and get back uh, to a good place. Um, we see a lot, uh, some, uh, you know, places practicing yoga. I see a sort of sensory walls in schools or sensory walking paths in school hallways. So, so I think all that to me says there's a there's a greater heightened awareness, not only about. Um, what social emotional um, conditions uh, and learning is all about, but also different strategies to use to uh, to address that. And and so I think you're just going to see more people become comfortable and aware and seeking professional development opportunities to uh, to see how that how that can be practiced as we begin to reopen schools. And also, I, I think we saw it during the closure when people were you know just talking on the phone with students or checking in remotely um, with, you know, with less of an intense focus on necessarily academic achievement and just asking simple questions like, how are you doing? And, uh, you know, um, is everything okay with you? Or, uh, you know, what, what has you, uh, uh, you know, uh, what has you worried or what has you joyful uh, these days? And understanding the importance of making both that kind of connection and showing that kind of care and then addressing uh, the kind of challenges that might surface. Great. Um, Linda, you want to have a, a final word, anything you'd like to have our panelists uh, take away from today? Linda, are you there? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. Um, I Social emotional learning and uh, academic learning do not need to be competitive. If you engage in the kinds of practices that Paolo was talking about, have kids center and you know feel the sense of support and caring, uh, they will be more ready to succeed academically. Uh, and so they don't need to be at odds. They should be seen as synergistic. Um, engaging kids in opportunities to get sort of Formative feedback on their work and revise it will build a growth mindset and a sense of agency, uh, building social emotional skills along with academic skills. So I think that's the frame of reference we want to bring into this new era of, you know, restart recovery and reinvention. I want to uh, thank both both of our panelists, uh, both Linda and Paolo, for your time today uh, and sharing those really important uh, examples and ideas about what we think, uh, how we think about um, what are some really important needs uh, for students who were there before and are there even more now. Um, and uh, really I'm hopeful that we can uh, highlight the whole child uh, experience and the social and emotional needs of students in a way that we may not have done in the past. Um, and, and be more uh, forthright with that. Uh, on our screen right now are some resources um, that, uh, that are for uh, folks to take a look at. And uh, again, I just wanna thank uh, Paula and Linda for joining us. I wanna thank the Learning Policy Institute for the partnership uh, and we will close it out for today.
Thank you, everyone.